must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support. And now for the show. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Pollan. And today I have a very special guest on to talk about um, more avenues regarding written communication as a healthcare provider. As today, I am very thrilled to welcome Dr. Jasmine Marcus, who is a physical therapist and writer currently practicing physical therapy in upstate New York. Now, a little bit of background, and then I'll have Jasmine introduce herself, but before becoming a PT, she was actually a journalist, and she was also a host of a college sports radio show in Israel. Jasmine's also a recently certified strength and conditioning specialist and a member of the American Physical Therapy Association, and is especially interested in combining PT with her media experience. Well, Jasmine, thank you so much for all that you've kind of done throughout your career thus far and all the contributions you've made, and of course, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Brandon. Yeah, no, anytime. We'd love to kind of sit down and chat because, you know, I, I know as I kind of just mentioned in that brief introduction there, I know there's a lot more into your background that I didn't go over, and I know you'll, I'll give you plenty of chance to go through that. Um, but, you know, just getting into that story of, like, how you were a journalist and, like, how you ended up becoming involved more with radio, like, mm-hmm. I'd love to just kind of know kind of what your story is regarding that and how, you know, everything has gotten you to where you are today, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. So being a writer or being a journalist was what I always wanted to do. Like when people talk about what they've wanted to do since they were little, that was my dream. Um, I think I naturally was good at writing. And then because I was good at it, I enjoyed it. And I just always sought out opportunities in high school and in college. I was an editor of the college newspaper. I had all my internships were in journalism. Some were in radio. And that was kind of everything that I was going towards. Um, The year after I graduated with my undergrad degree, I lived in Israel and was able to get an internship at a radio station where I ended up hosting this radio show. And I did that for a year. And during that time, this was about 2010, 2011, it was the height of the recession, a lot of newspapers and were shutting down or downsizing. And I watched as a lot of my friends were struggling to get jobs. And I just remember thinking, do I really want to have a job where I could get fired at any moment or not have a job or not have a good future? I wanted something a little bit more stable. And then throughout this year, I had some time to think about it. My dad actually kept sending me those articles you see of the top 10 most growing careers, you know, that type of thing. A lot of them were engineering or just computer science things that I just wasn't very interested in myself, but physical therapy was always on those lists. And I had had physical therapy on and off in high school for different cross country injuries. And it had always been something I thought was really cool and interesting to know so much about the body. And so I started to think a little bit more seriously about could I actually go back and do that? Do I want to go back to school? And I ended up getting an opportunity to shadow a physical therapist and then ended up working the front desk for him while I made these decisions. And then I had to go back and take a bunch of the science prerequisites that I hadn't taken as an undergrad. So I spent about a year or so doing that and then eventually went into physical therapy school. And so, and then since then, 
I had always been writing, so I just never stopped. So throughout school, I started my blog about what it was like to be a PT student because there wasn't a lot that existed in that realm at the time. And then now I've been practicing for about four years now. So it's morphed a little bit into me writing more for other publications. And then I also do editing of PT application essays for people applying to PT school. So a bunch of different things on top of working as a physical therapist. Man, but I'm sure that keeps you busy in a good way, though. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, and Jasmine, I kind of want to go off of that a second because (laughs) mentioning, of course, your history with journalism and all these different media things and kind of going through um, physical therapy school and how now you're kind of doing more, um, you know, also writing for other organizations, other Mm -hmm. websites and stuff, too. But, you know, how did you get involved, like, to be able to work and contribute to some of these big name publications? Like, what was that process like to get in there? Like, what was that like? Like, because I I don't know many people, PTs, that often go down that route. So that might be something that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So it took me a while to even feel like I had something to offer a publication like that. So at first, I was just writing about my experience as a student or as an applicant because that's what I knew. And I remember the first year or two of my career, it was kind of like, well, what would I have to say to a national audience? You know, I don't know enough to tell people what they should be doing or what they could be doing. And then eventually by maybe in the last year or so, I've just been more confident. I've been practicing for longer. So I've started to think more about writing for other publications. I do something where I'm on this listserv where publications who are writing about different health and science uh, topics, they can reach out to different people with questions that And like, I'll have the opportunity to answer and then I can be quoted in different publications as a physical therapist. So I started doing that a little bit. And then Runner's World actually got started because I followed one of the editors, Scott Douglas on Twitter. And then he, I guess, looked back at my Twitter and found my website and took a look at that. And then he actually reached out to me. I guess he liked what he saw and asked me if I would contribute because they're looking to have more physical therapists write for them and more experts write for them so that the message is coming straight from the source instead of being diluted by maybe a freelance writer who doesn't really know the material as well as a physical therapist would. So that kind of started the writing for non-PT publications. And then I have a few different other ideas in the pipeline that I'll hopefully get around to you now that I am done studying for the CSCS. Right. No, I can imagine that. And, you know, Jazz, how is writing for a, a publication like Runner's World or one of those big names, how is that different and similar compared to maybe even just doing on something like um, New Grad PT or kind of one of the other contributors as well? Like what's, what are some of those small little caveats there that make it different? Well, there is definitely a more thorough editing process and then it was actually really cool because I gave, in, the, in the article I wrote, I gave a few exercises and stretches, and I was kind of wondering, like, how are they going to incorporate these? And the process was really interesting. They had me send them YouTube videos of people doing the exercise, and then they took that as inspiration, and they had their own model go and shoot videos of her doing them somewhere. So it's like everything that I wanted to be included was included and you didn't have to worry about copyright because they went and shot it themselves, which is pretty interesting. So that was really nice because you're describing things and then you actually had a cool video of someone doing them. Um, So that was different. And then it's obviously more nerve wracking because you're opening yourself up to a larger audience and you're I, the response from my article was really positive, but you're always scared that someone's going to read it and like, you know, it's the internet. Someone's going to argue with you or disagree with you or I don't know, call you a name. So it was a little bit scary. I had a coworker take a look at it and kind of say like, is there anything that you think you would argue with or that someone would take an issue with? And then I had a couple of friends who weren't PTs read it to make sure it was understandable to them because that's who the target audience of runners world is not a physical therapist. So I definitely was more, I tried to prepare a little bit harder for it than I think I would for maybe a physical therapy website, but it, it would seem like it worked out in the end. So that was good. Well, good. And I mean, that seems to make a whole lot of sense. And, you know, and Jasmine, I, I'd love to kind of pick your brain on, you know, effective writing, especially for blogging, because given your experience and all those different avenues you had mentioned, 
And of course, recognizing that people that are listening are probably students, faculty, or even can have some variability within that. So based on what you've learned thus far, what are some of the tips you'd kind of recommend for writing and kind of really having a blog that's really effective in its written messaging? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is you have to decide who you're writing for. So are you writing for the general public or are you writing for physical therapists? Because you're going to write very differently and you're probably going to write about different things depending on who you're writing for. Or are you writing for PT students? So I think you have to know who you're writing for. That's the most important thing is picking your audience and then writing in a way that speaks to them. Because you're not going to go and explain what a hip flexor is if you're writing to physical therapists, but you need to if you're writing to the general public. So you have to know who the audience is, first of all. And then everything I wrote, I tried to make sure I could back up with research and with studies. And so you're not just saying, because there's certain things you think or you come to think as a clinician and then you're like, okay, but is there actually research behind this? So I didn't want anything that I wrote to be to put in and then realize, oh, actually there's no research for that. That's just something I think or something I've been told. So I tried to make sure that everything that I stated as a fact, at least had research behind it. If not, you know, everyone's not going to agree with everything, but it wasn't just something that someone had told me. It was, there's actually research to support what I was saying. Gotcha. And, you know, and Jasmine kind of going off of that to just a little bit, I know, like you had kind of said, of course, getting the right target audience and really providing things that are distinguishing fact versus opinion and providing research when that's warranted. What would you say then, of course, given that, you know, if there's a clinician out there in, in any kind of healthcare field for that matter, mm -hmm. I don't want to limit to just physical therapy, Yeah. but what advice would you have for other providers who are interested in pitching to the media? Like any tips or tricks you'd kind of recommend when it comes to that avenue? Because I'm sure that's yeah. a whole different beast. I think the biggest thing is you have to start somewhere. So you can't, I don't think you can just out of nowhere write to runner's world and say like, hey, I'm going to write for you. So like for me, I started first, I just wrote for myself and had a blog so people could at least go and see like, okay, she writes and she writes well. Then I started writing for maybe other people's blogs who I would find online. And then eventually it was publications like New Grad Physical Therapy or Covalent Careers, you know. So and then from there, when Runner's World saw that, I guess then they were interested in me. And then now when I go and start to pitch to other people, I can say like, I've written for this place and I've written for this place. But I think you need to start with something simple to prove that you are a writer. Because you know, to be a physical therapist, you have to be licensed and you have to go to school. But anyone can just go and say, oh, I'm a writer. But you have to have a way to prove that and say like, oh, I actually am a writer. Here's a website. Here are the articles I've written. This is what I've done. So you need something that backs it up. Is there like a list of like criteria that they look for? Like, because my question is like, how do you like objectively measure that? Like if you're looking at a candidate for writing, you know what I mean? That's like, yeah, that's, that's kind of yeah. what I wonder. Like, how do you do that? I think you don't. I don't think there's really a way to do it. I think you just, if you were picking someone who you want to write for, you just have to look at what they've done and see whether you like it and see whether you think it's good, see if they have the experience that you want. So, and that was, that was actually something that was uh, attracted to me in going to physical therapy school was that I liked the idea of having a concrete skill set that no one could take away from me and that I knew I could always use because yeah, anyone can say they're a writer and anyone, you know, a lot of it's luck. And that was, that was actually, that was very frustrating as an undergrad when we would go and all these writers would come in and tell us about how they got started at Newsweek or how they got started at the New York Times. And it was always a story of, oh, I was shopping and then my cart bumped into the editor of the New York Times and then I started talking to them and then I got the job. It was always something like that. It was never something that you could actually replicate or you could necessarily take to heart as advice. So it was kind of frustrating because you were like, okay, so what if that lucky thing doesn't happen to me? Maybe I will never get to be writing for the New York Times or writing for Newsweek and I could be the best writer ever, but something lucky like that wouldn't have happened to me. Whereas I feel like in physical therapy, you can have a good job and you can prove yourself and have the skill set that backs you up or the credentials that back you up in a way that you can't really with journalism. 
Well, I think a lot of it comes down to the aspect when it comes to these kinds of opportunities and things is who you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's kind of a, kind of a summary there because the big message I got from that was, so we have to find out where all these people work, where they spend their time, and then just mm -hmm. hopefully something happens, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, but I think that's really interesting because, you know, going off of that and kind of going man, more to, you know, our profession of physical therapy, of course, one thing that we've heard time and time again is um, that we have difficulties with effectively, com effectively communicating to the general public about what we can do as physical therapists. Now, yeah. I'm curious from your standpoint, mm -hmm. looking at it from, you know, a written communication standpoint, or even just kind of a general standpoint, mm -hmm. what do you think we are doing well with and what do you think we can improve with? Um, well, I think there is a lot to improve just because so many people don't know what physical therapists do. And even a few times a week, I'll be treating someone, let's say total knee replacement. And then they'll say, Oh, well, my back's hurting, but I guess I need to go to a chiropractor for that. And you know, they're coming in and seeing us and they still don't know that we can treat back pain. So I think the communication is a little bit lacking in that regard, but there's a lot of things that you can do. and. One thing actually we've been doing a little bit at my practice and I will try to take a stab at it pretty soon is we, some of our coworkers have been writing for local publications and writing about different things that they do and different ways that they can help people so that the people who are actually our patients will see it. Because, you know, if I write for Runner's World, not one of my patients might have read that. But if I write for the Ithaca Voice, you know, then potentially dozens of my future patients could have read that and could come in and know more of what we do. Um, I also see a lot of room, actually the APTA is pretty good at writing letters to the editor. So sometimes if there's articles in you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post where they talk about painkillers or they talk about different interventions, someone from the APTA will sometimes write in and say like, oh, actually physical therapy could have treated this and this is why, or this is how. So that's another way besides just writing articles, writing like these letters to the editors that kind of say what a physical therapist could have done about something. And do you find that, I know obviously given that when it comes to communication, written is just one form. Um, of course, you know, we have, you know, video, we have audio. Yeah. I mean, there's different mediums there. Do you, write, do you think that kind of a blend between all of them through a platform is probably most effective? Yeah, definitely. And there's, I think the APD is trying to do more with video ads and, you know, there's radio ads. So you definitely need a blend because not everyone is reading. And I think video is supposed to be becoming more and more popular. I don't personally love watching videos, but apparently that is the way of the future. So it's definitely important. Well, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting because I feel like I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> I'm so much all in the video and it's written. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not, not, not my favorite, but <laughs> exactly. But I also recommend, I never really liked writing and stuff when I was younger. Mm -hmm. but I think that's part of what's pushed me that way. And, you know, yeah. could, and would you say that maybe it's possible that maybe your upbringing more into the written stuff might've also led, had some effect on that of your avenue as well? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, you tend to like things that you're good at. So, you know, maybe I was good at writing and then I liked it and then I started to write more and then you want to read more and yeah, it kind of builds it onto itself. Yep. No, I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, it's kind of interesting here because seeing that you also do um, consultation and helping with editing for, um, you know, applications for PT mm -hmm. school of personal statements, you know, given that I'm sure there's many different ways to go about it and kind of seeing that, you know, you do this probably a fair amount, what would you say are, what, what is the secret to writing a memorable personal statement for a graduate school or even a job application to have the best effect? I think the, the biggest thing is you just have to write something that's interesting or that's different because probably nine out of 10 essays that I will read will be where someone describes the shadowing that they did. And so if you think about it, I'm even a little bit bored reading about the shadowing and I'm not the professor who has to read hundreds of these. And so you want to write about something different or something personal and you don't want to write about like the time I went to physical therapy and watched someone get treated for a knee replacement. And then besides the fact that that's not going to make you stand out, the things that you think are interesting as an applicant are interesting to you because you've never really seen physical therapy before, 
but they're not going to be the interesting story to a clinician. So, you know, the stories that you sit around and you tell your coworkers aren't, oh, this person came in with a knee replacement and then they could walk again. I mean, you probably see that 10 times a day. So to read about that is just not interesting if you've been practicing for many years and you're the professor reading hundreds of application essays. And then what I would also add to that is a lot of those essays are about what the student saw and the student is not even really in the essay. So they're just describing a physical therapy session. So you can read the whole essay and the student's not even really in the essay. So a lot of the essays that I get the first time around, I won't even edit them and I'll just respond back and say like, this is well written and this is fine, but you're not even in this and it's not gonna make you stand out. So a lot of the times I'll ask people to consider changing the topic that they're writing about. And at first I was kind of scared to do that because you know people have spent probably hours writing these things and they're sending it to me, hoping I'll correct some typos. And instead I'm coming back and saying, you need to totally rewrite this. But when I explain why people have been very receptive to it, and then they always come back with something that's so much more interesting afterwards. And sometimes it's about a difficult family situation or sometimes it's about a health condition they have. And it might have nothing to do with physical therapy, but then it's interesting and it's about them and it hopefully ties into why they'll be a good physical therapist. And I think that is so much better than reading about the time they went and watched someone bend their knee to 120 degrees. Yeah. And, and if I may kind of ask your thoughts on this too, I know one thing knowing that a vast majority or not maybe not a vast majority, but there's a significant number um, of clinicians that go into physical therapy, partially in which because they've also had a prior experience with physical therapy yeah. themselves. Yeah. So, I, and given how we as human beings tend to really like stories, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on people kind of telling their story as through the patient's eyes and, you know, leveraging that into their um, application as their personal statement? What yeah. do you think about that? That's tricky too, because like you said, so many people do that. So I think you need to find a way, if you are going to do that, to make it a little bit unique. And even my own essay, I touched upon the fact that I had sprained my ankle in high school and that's why I originally was in physical therapy, but then I kind of veered off from that and went into my background as a writer and as a journalist and that made me stand out and that was more interesting. So I think you can go into it, but I don't love those essays. Sometimes people will keep them because it is about them and they think it highlights them and that's their big defining story. And those people will still get into schools. But if you're only writing about the time I tore my ACL and had surgery and got back to playing soccer, it was obviously a huge defining event for you. But again, you're going to be one of many people who wrote that same essay. So I encourage people to try to not make their whole essay about that. Well, gotcha. And of course, going off of that, Jasmine, and saying, of course, how trying to be unique and then trying to also make it also be about you and your experience as well, rather than just like the event or just going mm -hmm. to therapy and seeing this happen. Are there any other big errors or mistakes or things that you kind of see that continue to often happen that you see with personal statements? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is just not tying it back into why you'd be a good physical therapist. Because ultimately, that's what you want the essay to do. So whatever it's about, even if it's about your injury, then you need to say why you need a little bit about why you want to be a physical therapist, and then you need a little bit about why you're going to be good at it. So you need in some way to be highlighting aspects of your personality and say why you'll be good at being a physical therapist instead of just saying, I've been to physical therapy and I want to be one. You have to tie into why you'll be good at it. And the essay is not going to ask that, but that's why you're writing the essay. They, can, they know your extracurriculars, they know your grades, they know your test scores, you know, they know everything about you. They want to know something that makes you different or makes you special or makes you seem like you're going to be a good physical therapist besides the fact that you did well on the GRE. Because at the end of the day, as you know, we're dealing with people all day. So you need to have something in your personality that's going to help you connect with people or something that's going to get you through school when school's really tough that's beyond a test score and shows a little bit about you. Well, yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And, you know, one thing I, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this, because if, if we look at just written communication across our profession, and specifically the big thing that comes to my mind right now is social media, when I think about posts and arguments that happen for this, oh. you know, it, it, there's a lot of them. Um, but what would, I would love to kind of pick your brain on 
what do you recommend for like tips to really improve and optimize the effectiveness of messaging, especially on platforms like that? Mm -hmm. Well, a big thing that I always notice, which I would, I'd be curious to hear if you notice this as much too, is grammar. So no matter what you're writing about, if your grammar is off, that to me just, it makes you seem less qualified to be talking about something in my opinion. And so like typos, things like that. Like if you're going to be sending a tweet or working really hard on a social media campaign, the grammar should be there and you should be showing that you're an educated, intelligent person. So I think that's the thing that I noticed first, but that's also, that's kind of what I do. So I don't know if your average person is going to care about that as much as maybe I would, but I think if you're going to be making an argument or you're going to be saying like, this is my profession and this is what I do, you have to be sounding intelligent as you do it. It's a fair point. And what do you think about like um, structure of a point, like any other things you would notice besides, of course, from a grammar standpoint? Mm -hmm. I know there's so many things on social media. There's also just, there's so many people just arguing and like being me like there's a way to argue without like totally trashing a person and sometimes some of the things that people are saying is just like you don't have to be so demeaning to a person just because they disagree with you you know they can disagree with you and you can say why but you don't have to troll them as a person so sometimes it just evolves into these fights and it's just like and then I think it it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like I was scared when I wrote the article for runner's world, because I was like, what if someone trashes me or argues against me? And I don't, it shouldn't be to the point where we're going to lose out on hearing people speak up because we're worried that someone could attack us. because there's room, you know, there's room for argument. And then there's room, there's a difference between healthy debate versus someone getting attacked. And I think that's always scary when you put yourself out there. Well, and I think also too, correct me if I'm wrong, I think, do you think it's possible that some people, they kind of view those two things as one and the same? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're on, online, you, I'm sure you see it. I don't know if it happens to you guys. I hope not, but you see some crazy things on Instagram and on Twitter and yeah. I can't say we've really had a whole lot. I mean, we've had some disagreement here and there mm -hmm. and that's fine. I mean, we're all open to that. We've never yeah. had really anyone be nasty. They've kind of more argued the points mm -hmm. and no problem with that. And, you know, and if someone does, if they do just attack just blindly, I'm like, you know what? That's okay. I'm just not really going to choose to listen to that if the point's not valid. If the point's valid, no matter what, I will always listen to it. Mm -hmm. It's not really a valid point, just like being nasty. Well, I don't really care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You know, but again, that's just me and not everyone feels the same way about that. And nor, nor should they. Um, but, you know, looking outside of our lens, Jasmine, so looking outside of PT. Mm -hmm. How do we compare to other healthcare providers when it comes to um, written communication across the healthcare arena? Like, how are we stacking up? There's just, there's so much more that comes out on a daily basis, I think, from doctors. You know, every time you read a mainstream publication, you can see doctors writing opinion columns and writing articles and being quoted all the time. So I think physical therapists should just be given the chance to put themselves out there a little bit more, to be to not be afraid to write some of these articles for publications. Um, sometimes, but sometimes, because I told you I'm in this listserv where journalists will ask questions to the public, and sometimes they'll ask a question and they'll specify like MD only, but they're asking a question like, what's the best way to recover from a knee replacement? Or, you know, they're asking a question that I think would be better answered by a physical therapist. So I think sometimes it's, journalists themselves maybe who don't even always realize who their best source is so that can be frustrating too sure no i mean that makes complete sense on that and you know if we go back because i know it's interesting how you and i had very different uh responses to communication written communication specifically mm -hmm. our, uh, early educational journey here and yeah. i recognize that there's it's not apples and oranges there's many different things that are going on it is apples and oranges excuse me because i realize we're there's a lot of different things going on here, but do you think that, you know, DPT education on a whole effectively incorporates um, how to really be an effective written communicator while in PT school and why or why not? I know my program did not. I mean, I could probably count on one hand the times that we got to write something and I was, I loved it. I was like, yes, we don't have to do another multiple choice test right now, but there's not a lot of writing that comes out of PT school, unfortunately. Although I will say we had an 
it wasn't an elective. Everyone had to take it, but it was kind of one of those courses at the end. It was a business course. And the instructor did have all of us write a letter to the editor in response to something so that we would get used to the idea of what that takes and what that's like. And I thought that was really cool. But as a whole, there wasn't a ton of writing. And sometimes when I would read my classmates writing, you know, if we had to comment on a discussion board or something like that, it was a little bit scary to see like, oh, these are people in graduate school and they're having trouble forming a complete sentence or, you know, something like that. And, you know, you think like, okay, how are their notes going to look when it goes back to an insurance company or something like that? So there probably could be a little bit more emphasis on writing, but there's also so much you have to do in PT school that I don't know that that should be the biggest focus. Well, and, and then another argument to that is, should it even be the program's responsibility? Should it be, should we yeah. have responsibility? Should we have had that more throughout early, earlier education or even high school education? Yeah. Like, that, that's the big question I, I would think. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think the country as a whole is probably not getting it enough in earlier in their education. Well, yeah. And do you think, given what you know now, do you feel like um, even through high school, undergrad, do you feel like writing is being effectively addressed based on what you're seeing or not really based on what you were telling me earlier? Yeah, um, probably not because even – as an undergrad and I was at Cornell and you have to take freshman writing seminars and you have a lot of classes where you're reading other people's writing and a lot of people just can't write well. And, you know, they come into college like that and I don't know how you fix it or when you fix it, but I don't know if taking one writing seminar really is going to fix that for the rest of your life. So I don't, it might just be something you have to learn when you're younger or you have to really dedicatedly learn as an adult, but I don't know what the solution is for that, but a lot of people don't write well, and I think that's pretty clear in a widespread sense. Well, absolutely. So I think that point, along with, I know some people, myself biased, that some people definitely, like I, I, like back early in the day, I loved math and science so mm -hmm. much more, and I just dreaded reading in English. Yeah. I, I just wasn't that good at it, and mm -hmm. I was open to it, but I was mm -hmm. just, just not getting it near as well as the other things because it, I felt like for me, I, it was more like science and math were so much more objective along mm -hmm. with theories. And that was so much yeah. easier to grasp to me for some reason than, you know, the English and that part more so. And, mm -hmm. and I know that there's other people that have gone both ways on that, but that's, I can understand how that can contribute to some degree for sure. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, and given, you know, of course, I want to dive into one last aspect when it comes to mm -hmm. communication, especially from a written point, And that's, as PT students, of course, they all have to go in through clinicals and how um, clinical instructors or CIs really can provide effective communication, especially with their CPI um, goals and that kind of thing. So from your opinion, how can clinical instructors uh, encourage or improve written communication with their students while they have them in the clinic? Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I actually, I just had a student and I'm about to get a new student. So I was thinking about that. And... I never really have thought about written communication with my students as much, but a big thing is I'm sure or you know is I emphasize oral communication. So pretty early on with my students, when the patients start to ask me questions, I'll let the student answer. And if they're really floundering or if you know they say something that's incorrect, I'll jump in. But I try to get them used to those situations and so I try not to say like oh I'll answer and then you'll learn from me and you'll learn what a good answer is I kind of will say you answer figure it out and if it's a bad answer you're going to learn from that and then the next time you'll be less awkward when you say it because I think the best way to learn is to do it and you're going to get those hard questions and you're going to get the vague questions of when will this get better and what exactly is going on and you need experience answering those so I think a big thing I do is I just Early on, I just try to let my students just do it and see what happens. And then later we'll talk about it or talk about how they could have said something different or better. But I think some of it is just kind of making them get their feet wet and just jump in and see what happens. Well, and with that, I really like how you let them be themselves because I know one thing, I forgot what study it was. I can never remember study names very well, but yeah. there was one that they basically said that um, newer clinicians practice a lot like their last CI or it was something along that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good that you're not like trying to control and turn someone into you. You're saying, mm -hmm. Hey, I want you to be you. And mm -hmm. that, and I'll give you some signs on when that may or may not 
be the best way and we can talk about it, but you're, you're, you're really letting them be themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's something I really, really do appreciate and respect with, you know, your method on that, because I do think sometimes there is kind of a tendency to control and kind of make a mini me, shall I say? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, I like how you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, because it's, it's important. And, you know, we got to, of course, ask Jasmine, because this is our finale question, because, of yeah. course, being called the uh, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, we have to ask this question at the end. And what it is, is if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, whether that be physical therapy or other healthcare provider related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? So what I wish was actually something that would be more for the greater public. And I wish that maybe in high school, everybody learned anatomy because I guess because I didn't always want to be a physical therapist and I didn't study it until later on, even after my undergrad, I have a very clear divider in my mind of kind of how I understood things before I was a physical therapist and then how I understood things afterwards. And I remember taking anatomy, even at the undergrad level, just totally changed the way I thought about my body. And I learned, you know, you learn, most people don't even know what's the difference between a ligament and a tendon and they don't know where muscles are or even how to know if a muscle is what's bothering you or not what's bothering you or you feel i would like you'd have a pain and you could say like oh this is probably a muscle or this is probably this or it's coming from here or it's not coming from here and it just totally changed the way i thought about my body and i just thought it was so useful beyond even eventually becoming a physical therapist and then i remember thinking you know why did i learn about um photosynthesis like eight different times in school and why did I learn, you know, some of the more higher end stuff I learned in physics or in chemistry? And those are things that are good to know and maybe can be helpful if you're eventually going to go into a science career. But everyone has a body and everyone, most people don't really know that much about it. I mean, even the most educated professors will come and see me and say, you know, oh, my knee hurts. I really think it's a ligament. And if I feel comfortable enough, Sometimes I'll say to them, do you actually know what a ligament is? And they don't. And then they don't really have a reason for why they think it's a ligament that hurts them. And they don't really have a way to describe how their pain hurts or when it hurts. And health literacy is a really big problem. And I think one way to tackle it would be to standardize teaching anatomy to younger people and to teach it instead of some of the other sciences that I think are less useful on a day-to-day -day basis. And I say that obviously as a scientist who has a big respect for science, but I think I could have learned a little bit less physics or a little bit less about animals in biology. And I wish I had learned more anatomy. I think that's a really interesting answer because that's not one we've heard before and it makes a lot of sense. So I love it. And what are your thoughts on just adding to that? Because obviously getting into just early education, because I, I definitely will agree with you. There are some things that I learned that I didn't necessarily think were the most relevant for my path later. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my thought on that. And, but yeah. I think if, if everyone had to take a little anatomy, but then also like, mm -hmm. like no basics of exercise, basics yeah. of nutrition, basics definitely. of self hygiene. And you know, how many, that's so much more relevant to your daily life than chemistry or physics or calculus or so many of the other things that we learn in middle school and high school. I mean, we've all seen those memes that are like, oh, thank God, you know, it's tax season. Well, thank God I learned about parallelograms or, you know, those memes. And it's true. So, I mean, there's so many things that we could learn, but obviously our bias as physical therapists is that we wish people knew more about health and wellness and anatomy. Well, and, and it's not like the other stuff isn't important. It's yeah. just that, you know, Everyone has these things, like you had kind of said. Everyone, this is health that we're talking about mm -hmm. because if we look at just costs and the issues that are going on between health and all that, it's it's not good. And I think yeah. whether this now is this going to solve everything? Probably not. Is it at least a step in the right direction? It's 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 a positive step for sure. I definitely don't know the logistics of how that would go because. Yeah, I, I don't even want to tackle that because I don't know enough to. Yeah, yeah. That, but but I think that's a really interesting idea, and I love it when we get something that's different. 
you know, this goes back to your unique point earlier, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jasmine, I, I appreciate your time and everything. And thanks again for coming on. And I, I realize that some of our listeners might want to follow up or kind of learn a little bit more about you and kind of maybe mm-hmm. want to check out some of your work. Um, where can people reach out or kind of look online if they kind of want to follow up or learn more? Yeah. So my website is jasminemarcus.com and that has all my articles and links to everything. And then um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for all of those. I'm J Marcus DPT and pretty easy to find on any of those. Well, perfect. And guys, they'll be in the show notes. So if you just scroll down, if you're on your phone, all those links are right there um, for you guys to check out. Um, well, Jasmine, again, thanks so much for your time, effort, and your insight. It's been a true pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on, Brandon. Of course. Anytime. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.